Hey folks, Nick Tockert here with the Historical Fencing Guild. Um, one, just a second before we get really rolling into things, I do want to apologize for being slightly late. We're also having some mild technical difficulties, which is why I am slightly late. So I will try to hold the show and make things work as best I can. Um, it just seems to be our internet is being less stable than usual, which is saying something. All right, before we get into it, uh, the we need to uh, talk about what makes uh, the Historical Fencing Guild happen. And of course, uh, that is, you know, the good folks over at IndieCD.org, the Independent Creator Directory, which is your one-stop shop for the best and the brightest musicians, authors, and other creatives. Um, if you are looking for a home, please consider going there. We're also made possible by the sales of my books, The Simple Sword, the Fighting Axe, and the Simple Spear, all part of my ongoing, yes, ongoing series of Western martial arts novels. A new uh, edition is hopefully due out by the end of the year. Um, I have some other things queued up before that, uh, being a multi-subject multi uh, author. I do a great many things. I also want to uh, shout out to my Patreon patrons, the wonderful folks who help me keep the lights on. You're off in the woods, Frog G, Ronald Rain, Bladed Thesis, Brian Kamor, Cindy Kep, and the OG himself, Mr. Steve Augusto. These fine, six fine people have donated as little as a dollar a month to help me keep the lights on, buy trainers, buy gear to review, um, outfit people. I actually was spending some of that money on some potential loaner gear and or new gear, depending on how it fits, at Goodwill today. So we'll talk briefly about that once I chat, line up with the chat. But please, um, if you want to help out, patreon.com slash the historical fencing guild. Um, there will be actually really soon uh, Guild exclusive, uh, Patreon exclusive videos for the Guild. A few other really neat things are in the works. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. Now we're going to go through the chat real quick to catch up with who's here. And it's Thesis. Hi, hi, hi. Hello, Thesis. And Foxy is here too. Excellent. Lady, lady and gentlemen, I am sorry that there was a delay. Thank you for your patience. Now today I wanted to talk about something a little different than what I normally do. Um... And depending on time and interest, we may shoot over and check out some things on uh, our good friends over at Purple Heart Armory. But for now, um, I want to talk about the difference in one of the primary differences in uh, training that I see from the people who are training from the perspective of uh, historical manuals. Uh, personal defense versus military, and it may not be what you think. And we're joined by Miss Saren, uh, the lovely uh, voice of Haints and Hellfire, my horror anthology novel, which is buried over here. She will be doing the full audiobook for it. I am very eager to get that out. Um, and Kitty, our resident rope dart expert. Glad to see you all. Um, I, I was watching some videos and people who have come into the background of especially Western martial arts from the perspective of uh, the fantasy group. I'm glad to hear it. It's you may hear banging in the background as they bring in groceries. It's been, it was one of those uh, we got caught in some traffic, but uh the trick that I found is that uh, people, when, when they train very often in Eastern martial arts, as a rule, train from the perspective of uh, a single fighter against a single to a very small group of fighters. And uh, there are things you can get away with weapon-wise and... Uh, attitude-wise and movement-wise that you simply can't get away with uh, uh, in, in, in a larger melee setting where uh, lines are being commanded and there are um, 
goals bigger than survival. Uh, the the mentalities are radically different. Uh, there's much more attrition. There's much more uh, steadfastness in the styles, and there is much more limitation in movement. You know, give me just one second. Okay, there we go. Sorry, we're, we're going to be using that screen a little bit as I, I talk about things. But um, I wanted to uh, get into the, uh, the, the reasoning for this because I teach people from baking, building from melee conditions out. And the vast majority of, of instructors I found teach from single combat ramping up to melee a turn that they are um tournament focused and um alec is here and said make sure to like and subscribe thank you alec good man and i don't know if i would call my ex myself an expert but i'm definitely a student of rope dart i would put you as much higher than anyone else here so that's why you are our resident expert i, I am the resident expert on a large number of uh of weapons and styles while I am here by myself. But being that I'm a generalist, very often I can get guests either in the chat or in panel format with me who can go much deeper into any given style than I have elected to. Because I come at it from the perspective of an instructor, first and foremost, a uh, fire and forget uh, slash uh, Harrier style uh, combat, if given the sh the chance, and a uh, instructor and a small uh, unit commander. I'm very good at t training and uh, commanding small skirmish units that have been given, you know, carte blanche to engage targets as we find them. Uh, you know, go where we're needed and just leave us alone. And we'll be talking about the kind of roles that, that people have when we get into this. This is going to be a very light, you know, survey into the subject, but I think it's important because, um, well, a, 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 as, you know, as Thesis is much more an expert in most Chinese weapons than I am. Well, He's more than I am in, in most Chinese weapons and styles. I just have the talent to make any of them go and show just about anybody a way to make just about any weapon work as a practical system. It may not be the prettiest. It may not be the most elaborate, but I can make anything go. But when we look at... Um, Line combat, we got to talk about a few things. So I'm going to bring up my digital whiteboard here for just a moment. Let me see if I can do this right. Let's see, is this, do I like that format or do I like this format? I think I like this format better. Um, and I'll just hide that for a moment. And I will, let's see, what am I running? Can I pencil? Okay, that's okay. It's a terrible color though. So what I'm going to do real quick is I am going to go here, I'm going to go right here. I'm going to do that. That way, the the blatant white isn't burning your your um, your uh, retinas out. I will do this. This way, you can see. Now, we have talked extensively about an individual. Forgot to switch color. Give me a moment. So we'll go here, and I'll even do this. I'll give myself a layer to draw on so I'm not fighting everything. It's blood mode normal, but fine. When you have uh, an individual, okay, this is from the top. So we'll just do this, okay? This is going to make sense in just a second, okay? And 
they're they're squared off, but we're doing this for ease of understanding. You've got a, a sword and a board, right? And uh, Thesis says, thanks, love, but you can definitely kick my butt in rope guard. I need to get enough money to, you know, arrange for you guys to uh, have better situation. When you are fighting in a melee or any circumstance, you have circles of range that radiate out from you. Oh, boy, that's that's a circle. I'm a professional artist. I can make a circle. Anyway. My hands are still shaky. That's fine. Actually, you know what? We'll do it this way. Boop, 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 boop. I have tools. And if I'm having a bad hand day, I'll be smarter about it. No, no. There we are. Come here. And we'll go here. So, circle. Apparently we are doing very, very fat circles. Circle. And circle. Cool. It's not perfect, but it gets the idea. Yes, I love stick figures. And we're going to go back to this. And we're going to do nice fat pens. So, you know, chonkify the stick figure so you can see what's going on. Right. So we've got a very simple. You know, he's got a sword. He's got a board. Now. I'm going to add another layer, just a second. That way, if I want to not mess with things. An opponent who is here is within reach of his unarmed, his unarmed strike, okay? So if you put your arm out, that is the first circle you have to control. Cerato, Adnitid, Gare. Well, um, I I can see the jello. So you have to take care of this guy first. Here we go. Then if you have a guy, let's say, over here. And he you know. We're not even gonna worry about their weapons. And then maybe a guy over here. Let me see. Over here. I've color coded it for uh, severity. Okay. It's obvious you would engage them. Uh, one, two, three. And you would circle to keep. You want to always have your engaged opponent between you and the person who wants who wants to uh, aid them. It's okay. You guys can have your inside jokes. So this is where mobility becomes imp very important. So uh, you know, if the this fella would want to move for the first engagement. Let me get a uh, color that well that probably won't show up well. I need one that'll show up well. Okay, that should. Show up well, and we'll just make it thick. No. He's going to want to move over here so that he can engage this one while tangling this one. The number three still has to close, but is it a problem? As soon as as soon as I've engaged number one and hopefully you know defeated him. I'm going to want to come around and engage number two. Oops. Sorry about that. Keep trying to make sure that these two are kept separate. I kept tangled up in each other. And then after two, hope, hopefully, you know, I can come around and deal with three. And then it just becomes a one on one. When you are fighting single, against multiple or single on single you have a lot of options and you have to stay you stay very very fluid you you give territory to gain advantage you take territory to um gain control it's it's a rhythm set right 
Well, that's all well and good until uh, let me hide these guys and add another layer. You've got your circle of control, but you've got a line of colleagues okay forming some kind of that this is a very simple shield wall but suddenly the first thing you feel when you're dealing with a shield wall or a, in formation combat is just how limited your movement becomes. Okay? Now, I, I, I'm trying to keep the weapons all very similar in prospect so that you can tell what's going on, right? Optimally, you would want your uh, left-handed people here to engage... You know, the edge of your line, but you get the idea. Suddenly, your your whole motion is a matter of are you going forward with the line in which everyone is? Or are you going backwards with the line, you know, you're falling back. Still, this is very uh, Now, see, we're going, we're, we're going to talk into this. It uh, depends on the formation of the weapons. Foxy and I made quite a few formations for our house in Boffer that worked quite well while still giving us absolutely Remember, I am starting, whenever I start talking about a concept, guys, I start from the training wheels level, okay? You have to stand before you can walk, walk before you can run, run before you can dance. But what this is going to do, and, and you did get a, a little ahead and understand where we're going, is understand that our suddenly your movements are impaired because you're not operating. Further, you have to trust that somebody back here with whatever weapons they're holding can see the line, understands what's going on better, and they'll tell you to do things like maybe wheel right, which would mean the left let me let me do this because I'm using green as a as a motion marker. This whole left flank goes this way to face an enemy that might be coming diagonal. So let me let me see this. Uh, so let me get the red. This is the line of the enemy coming in. So you would want this side to move to face them on the right, while this side actually retreats to wheel, to turn the whole line like a wheel to face them. It's a much more complex movement. And right now I've made it with everybody armed, you know, equally armed the same. From there, you have to know not just where you are, but where everyone else is and what is needed to fit in while you're listening to this guy it gets very complex, very quiet. At least some certain people, yes. Now, it's really interesting you get into that because um, let's just get rid of all this. We'll give him a sword back, it doesn't matter. This works as long as this person, the, the commander, so we'll just do C, 
and I'll put an X if that's me, knows what they're talking about and has perspective. Uh, and see, we will talk about formations later. But when you are in tight packs, especially if... Uh, give me a second here. If we have some terrain elements, dark green. That is not dark green. That is the impeding, you know, the mobility here. Let me do this for a second. No, not too far. There we go. So let's say we have a creek running over here that's fast. And you've got some nasty shrubbery. Suddenly your motion is much more limited. You need to understand where you are relative to all your people. Okay? This is radically different. And this is why when you see people with very large weapons, so let's let's say this guy next to me is running a I need my pen back. You no, know, a great sword. So he's running a great sword. Look at his circle. Okay, so his circle, his first one's about the same as mine, which means we can roughly stay out of each other's way. But his second one, instead of being at full extension, it's going to be way out here. So that means anything that he wants to do towards me is going to interfere with my, the area I'm controlling. This is how people get tangled up. Now, I'm doing it stationary, and we're not talking more complex movements because we need to get this settled in. You need to understand what we're doing with these kind of people. Okay? This is why it's best for everybody to at least start out with a simple style of uh, of weapon, okay? Get rid of that. Sorry, I put that on the wrong layer. We're not worried. And it means you have to to realize that your movement is going to be limited to arcs, okay? I am limited. To this double uh, Lord de Lee pattern of motion because left to right can be done. You can side left, side right, and that sidestep. But the whole unit has to move or split. And anytime there's a split, anytime space enters between people, there's weakness. So you have to think about this. Now let me let me ask you something. Do you think in this kind of tight skirmish, a large horizontal sweeps work really well? No, because you don't have room to to get the power behind a lot of the sweeps. You don't have a lot of the control. You're still looking at okay. This sword's effective strike would be from here to about here. If something gets in this arc of it, and then we're always looking at this without moving to adjust. From now, we're we're understanding the basics. I know I'd have to lunge. To get out here because this is my lunge line this is my maximum that we might be able to get okay but if i lunge what happens now i'm out of position which makes a gap which means i can get flanked getting flanked is bad So now we're going back to our dude. 
when we are talking um, about brute movement, then we have to look at things from a larger perspective. So actually, let's hide our dude. He's down here somewhere, and I'll put another line up, and I'll put it way up here so I can find what I'm doing. When you have line combat, and this is something I have experienced and I have found uh, pretty straightforward. Oh, you know what? I did that thing again. Where's my gray? Is that gray? No, no, that is gray. Okay. So, no, because we're using that for movement. I don't want to change the color coding on anybody. We're going to go here. Here. Here, 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 here. Give us about seven. All right. And then we've got seven bat, uh, opponents. And right now I'm just using dots to keep things simple. So equal numbers. If you engage in combat straight on, you know, both sides are moving at each other, you're going, it will turn into, at best, a whole line of balanced fights, one to ones. I watched this happen. However, they were not prepared. For crossfire. Because people were thinking to to and and this sort of believe it or not, strip fencing, a collegiate fencing, is of the dualist mentality. And the dualist mentality is a beautiful thing, it's an honorable thing. However, it is not what will uh, what works when numbers start to come out. We had about where we had, let me just grab a bluish color. We'll go purple over here for our commander dude. And like this pinkish for their commander dude. And, you know, what would happen is these guys, there'd be a bunch of fights. And as soon as one person gets axed, so they'd ax the person next to me. That person could engage while I'm dealing with this person it becomes two on one. It's basic. So this is the simplest introduction to understanding this kind of combat. Now, there are problems with this because this turns it into a one on one. Okay, I'm going to put my fighters against your fighters. We'll see who's best. Not necessarily what we want. It certainly doesn't make tax sense tactically. So let's go back. And I know I lost our commanders when I did that. That's fine. We're not going to worry too much about the commanders. This is basically how I, I saw novice commanders acting. Just march at the enemy, do what you're told, and then die. I don't like that. So what happened when... Uh, when I said I was done with it, I looked at the, the young lady to my side and I said, are you getting tired of dying first thing? And she goes, yes. What we're going to do then, because our commander is going to tell us to march straight in like he's done every bout, because he's more worried about his personal bout over here. As soon as they take a step forward, we're going to take a step back. Okay? And what that looks like Is this they went forward? And we went back.
Now, what this did is it caused a very predictable outcome. We, we showed you the line. They're still thinking like this. They're still seeing this the straight lines we talked about. So what happened? Everybody advanced. Apparently, I miscounted on the reds, but that's okay. And when they advanced, they closed. So it looks like this, guys. Well, let me get rid of those green lines because they are going to cause some problems for me. These guys went here. And we're going to go here. What? No, that's not what I want. That's what I want. There we go. And they engaged. There should be another red guy, so we're, we'll put that in in a second. I just goofed that up for a second. So there we go. This guy's here, too. Close enough. Disengage. But, you know, this is still breaking down normal. These guys are going to take the flank and try to take the flank on this guy because he's suddenly facing three opponents. It's okay. That guy was kind of a dick. Now, uh, and, and we're joined by Trelane who says, I love doing me melee battles, especially as a shield. And we will definitely talk about that. Group battles in Buffer, they were fun when groups work together. And hey, try. Yes. Well, so we'll pull that out. And we will just kind of demonstrate what happened there, which is a little trickier. These guys. Blink, came here. And rotated about like this to come give this guy a bad day. Which is fun. This is fun. So while that's going on, us, well, we now gain, they don't realize that with a little bit of, of sneakiness, we can flank around. And as they close, we're just moving and grooving to flank their flank. Because as long as this guy can hold for a second or two, and it was good enough to do it. Very tall guy, had lots of reach. We could come in and she fought one, my, my little co comrade in arms, and I fought one. And then this guy killed her. And because of the way our, our forces were divvied up, these guys were just consistently beating our guys. Now, there was a slight trade-off over here, but I killed somebody on our team because he was being a dick. Don't worry about it. But that gave me something interesting. Let's get rid of all this stuff first. Uh... Actually, no, we'll just use the eraser. I'm making this too complicated. Okay, we can get rid of all this stuff, all the dead people. Yay! Because the, the, the uh, teams were not fairly balanced, and the people who were quote-unquote new, uh, let me do that, they were getting zapped. Pow, pow, on down the line. And, of course, the commanders are over here, you know, having their foot payday. The problem was, while they were killing them, I was free to come up and come at them from the blind side and either, excuse me, my lord, you're dead, or go, hey, pop and nail them. So I went hopping. Literally, they're killing my, my line. I can't stop. I can't help that my line's dying. But I can't avenge them. Literally, by flanking around, because they were thinking in straight terms, went pop, 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 
pop till we get to our two commanders who are over here and over here. So, everybody's dead. Everybody. Gone, 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 gone. And you have two commanders. And they literally begin to soliloquy, monologue about how the battle has come to just being them. With one mild problem. Okay? Here. Hold on. I'm not dead yet. So being me, and you utilizing the secret technique of simply quietly not being dead, while they were busy, I'm sorry, busy gleefully uh, speaking of each other's glory and how wonderful the battle is, I got to right here Uh, yes. And I said, I even stopped as I was passing. And I asked, uh, the marshal. I said, I'm not dead. That's right, right? Yeah. Okay. So, as soon as they were in the middle of their little, actually in the middle, it was rather rude of me. I said, excuse me, my lord, what? My lord, what? Pow. Because what? I wasn't dead. I literally just walked up to him. Because we went from line on line. And being not dead. Not dead yet. This is good. This is what we want. not dead yet. Now we got some commentary. And uh, let's see. Uh, hey. Greetings, greetings. And it's really fun when people forget victory conditions and only concentrate on the battle. Oh, I love that. I, oh, give me that. Because my goal is victory conditions. My goal is always victory conditions. I talk about real life. What, what are your victory conditions? Let's see, my victory conditions. Let's see here. Oh, wait. Yeah, I need a new layer. There we go, cool. One. Don't die. That is always one of my major Victory conditions in an engagement. That unless unless uh, protecting is necessary. So if you're guarding somebody, keeping them safe comes first. However, if you die, you can't continue to keep them safe. Which pulls us right back to don't die. Condition two. Victory condition two. Go to bed with same number of holes in me. That I started with I don't want to get poked or smoked if you get what I'm saying. And then three no jail. So 
So let's, let's bring these three very, very good bits of strategic thinking. This is the basic, if you don't know what your, your uh, victory conditions are, these are it. It is not be cool. It is not slay the entire enemy by the might of my own hand. Don't die. Go to bed with the same number of holes that you started out with. Don't go to jail. Okay? And you, you have the sliding scale of I will you, you have to sometimes risk jail to prevent having holes in you. You may have to risk having holes in you to make sure you don't die. These are the prizes. And even when I am in a fictional tournament, even when we're playing, folks, this is the basis of the philosophy. Okay? So we got the big three. Let me get another layer. I'm going to hide this layer. So we have that. Oh, that's the wrong color. We'll go black again. So, guys, we got the big three. This is the most important part of your sword fight. Uh, uh, sword fighting uh, victory conditions. The next one, what's here? Scenario area conditions. And one thing I love when I have the fighters out after everybody's in decent shape, is to talk about scenarios. And let's see. Think, we'll go into um, really fun when they forget victory conditions and only concentrate on the battle. Yep. Killing them and looking impressive. Now, it should not, it should not be that I have to say this, but looking for impressive glory, uh, Honors, awards, this, this is effectively the BS tier, okay? We ain't, ain't nobody got time to do that, okay? So we're going to get rid of that so I don't get in trouble, but. You have to secure the bottom before you worry about the top. Okay? What does that mean? That means if, if I can hit a scenario condition that, that makes me win the plot of a scenario, doing it, I, it does not matter if I have to kill them. It does not matter if I have to raise my sword. Okay, so I will tell you there is a secret tier right here, and that is at practice have fun. Okay, I shouldn't have to discuss that, but scenario conditions. I've seen so many people try to fight their way. I've done tactics games where I've gone. It is mechanically impossible for me to win the scenario with the units I, I have been given. I can do a few things, but I cannot mechanically win the scenario. Because, I, you know, I understood what was being done. What are scenarios? And what 
uh, no, I don't need malware bytes to talk to me yet. All right, this, and we'll go on. Let me go through some chats. Or uh, or when they're against let some think they've won the battle before it even started. Yes, I want that. I want them to think they've won. The Black Rose was the best house again. So anyone they went up against, any, anytime they went up another, they won before the fight even started, until they came up with somebody who actually knew how to fight. The week before we decimated them in multiple house decided you, you can't have formations. It's against the rules. And then there's no play, point in playing because now they're just being dicks. Let's see. We were playing catch the potato one day. My friend was given the potato. I was her shield maiden. The other team completely forgot about the potato. We won three times in a row. Dear Lord, how many times did that happen uh, with Warball? How many times was Warball scored? So, let's talk about scenarios I like to play. And let's see. Uh, capture the flag. Fox will left. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got him good. I had not yet died. Aw. He had two lives. He kills me. I pop back up, and bam, he's dead. We were playing capture the flag, and we picked the spot downhill bottom of the park, so anyone... Who came for our flag, came running down the hill and couldn't stop in time. Betrayed by the high ground? Yes! Yes! Friends, use your terrain against your opponents. I want to always see you blinding them with the sun. One guy slashed at me, Foxy and our king's fiance in quick succession. LOL. Sounds like an MXC gauntlet. And he was all okay. F me, I'm... I'm dead. Not sure which is more entertaining. That one or when we played Highlander outlasted everyone because I had actually weapons training and knew my stuff. Okay. Be careful because that you've run into situations where you were the better uh trained individual. Always go in ready for them to be better than you. I mean, take the gift of their stupidity whenever offered, but um ready for them to come out you. So let's talk about um, uh, scenarios and why they matter. One thing, um, most, you know, to start most melees, there is a shady tactic called leg them and leave them. Okay, so even if it's a, a last man standing, whoever wins, uh, good, Foxy. Um, you in in uh, SCA conventions, a shot to the leg makes them sit or kneel. They become immobile. But if their spawns, if you kill them, they just respawn. Right? So one of the best things you could do if you're trying to hold a field and you have something else going on is leg as many of them as possible and neutralize their forces in a way they can't res. Now, most groups trained, somebody's legged, leave them behind, they'll slow you down. Not the historical fencing guild. When someone is legged and they can't move, they become the anchor of the line. And what we do is we hold our own. Because if they can inch along, we all inch along. We started with that as a, this is going to be my policy because I'm not going to teach you cowardice and the ease of sacrificing others. That's not how I train. Oh, I understand thesis. And I'm, I'm not worried about it. I'm just saying. It is a very different mentality than uh, others. So what do we have? What we started training 
We did that. I made that a policy and I hammered it into my students. Okay. Let me clear the board. Wow, it's just like dry erase. I've got marks all over the place. That's fine. What we started doing is we have most of my list fields look like this. Okay. This is my standard setup for a list field. Okay. Table. These are the ropes. There's, you know, probably more supports, but it's always about rig like that. Okay. One team. So the defenders. All are trying to keep one person who cannot fight. They cannot fight. They cannot run. They have to walk, and they can be unarmed. And safely get them, usually from way over here to over here. So usually they have to get them out the list field. And then starting, so if they start there or there, opposite them, you have the attackers. And yes, they usually outnumber. Their goal is to kill that person. So what you end up with is a group. If you train in this kind of drill and scenario, you end up with a group who understands that if you need to get through the line, you have a pulse charge, and you are guarding the, the person's back, you are watching them, you are going through. Why do I do this? Why this drill? Of all the scenarios we could play and talk about, why do I do this drill? I'll tell you why, friends. Uh, because do you know what happens when you're at a busy concert, a uh, major event, festival, fair, a uh, street party, and one of your own gets sick or twists an ankle? You are now surrounded by a whole group of people who are at best neutral oftentimes antagonistic simply because you're in the way or whatever, with the smattering of actual threats sprinkled about D-bags who, if they see somebody hurt, will try to take negative attention. My people, and I've seen it happen, somebody gets hurt, we form a circle around them, we make sure that they are uh, safety first and take care of, and then we keep uh we keep moving and we get them out usually you find a wall so that you only have to defend one side and you go till you get out of whatever it is preferably ahead of the major conflict now doing this will give you uh give you a different kind of tactical awareness and I never, ever, ever, ever do anything for just one reason. It is not to say I'm manipulative, because I'm not. But I never do anything for just one reason, because by having multiple reasons to uh, act positive towards an action, I am, I am less likely to be inaccurate or unwarranted in that decision. It's not about being right or wrong. It's not about winning or losing. It's about accuracy. It's about being correct, making the correct choice. So, this is why we train this way. There are other um, scenarios we could get into, and I think it's a uh, it's a good subject matter for us to discuss. Now, I know this isn't my usual format of video. It's been a while since I've done the, the whiteboard style. I, I'd like to know if this is something you guys are finding educational, if you're finding it entertaining. Because if you are, next week, I'll go into more different scenarios and responses 
slowly upping the complexity and specificity of the uh, engagements. But I, 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 I saw you, uh, I rather enjoyed the, doing the bull ring training method we, I created for our house. Honestly, most successful training methods I, uh, came, came from Foxy. I'm sure you guys have that mindset. Now, the whole whiteboard thing was neat. Okay. What you don't, what most of the people here, except for, you know, my beloved Trelanda, don't know is the Historical Fencing Group Guild group started out of the Historical Fencing Guild workshops, wherein we would meet out at the South Haven Public Library in the meeting room, and we would discuss the kind of things that we could not discuss during practice, because once you put swords in people's hands, they get, you know, I want to go fight. I want to go beat on people. And it is very important to keep these concepts active and fresh and keep understand them at a point when you're not distracted by I have weaponry and friends I can hit and fr friends who can hit me and it's good. So I want to start revisiting these as a precursor mental buildup to when I can start actual practices. Um, which I will be discussing with Amanda, watching the weather, and shortly happening. There may be a ramp up where I invite um, a couple people down to who I know are trainer types, so definitely Trelane, a couple others. And then we worry about folding new people in once the, uh, if I said the additional staff are um, present. But part of that education beyond understanding the gear, which I'm going to do a whole thing on to, to give you guys a refresher on how we approach gear, is understanding the tactics and strategies and the difference between the two that we uh, implement to try to explain these concepts to the new people and to the people you know in the digital guild. Um, if you really do like this format, and at least Foxy does, I may do some pre-recorded, slightly more scripted uh, lectures, for lack of a better word, and throw them up on the Patreon for the Patreon members. Um, we'll see about that. But um, I think I'm at a good point to stop, and we're at about the hour. So I want to thank you guys for uh, coming in and having a good chat, for staying on topic. Um, while I do like having my off-the-rails shenanigan-laden uh, exploits, it's nice to be able to get in and do what the guild was designed to do, which is help fighters come up with uh, strategies, discuss the strategies you have, and implement them. Um it's just a beneficial, positive thing we can do to uh, work on that. And if you guys really get heavily into this, and obviously, you know, there are some limitations on what groups are where. Where is that? Should be this one. The first game I designed is called Melee. Um, it used to be you could only get it from me, but it is used on grid or chess boards using units that, you know, whatever units you can get to represent these guys, uh, paper cart cutouts, whatever. Very simple rules so that you can practice your strategies based around the archetypes of fighters. So if this kind of strategy interests you, this little book, which is very inexpensive, uh, might interest you as well. This was the first game I ever developed for publication. I did it with a jet. I, uh, had it play tested with a beautiful man by the name of Jesse Tibbetts, who may he rest in peace. Uh, you may be really, and this isn't me uh, just trying to hawk my stuff. This is something that might apply to you. Because being able to have armchair quarterbacks, especially with people who may not have the physicality to pull off the tactical assessments that they found, but know if, if you could do it, what would work against these people, and you can test it a bit. 
it's not perfect. It is a very early game of mine, but I'm very proud of it. I want to thank you all for a lovely night, a lovely conversation. Um, I am going to have a treat in just a minute and get my blood sugar back up because I actually came skidding in the door from shopping and my dinner was uh, macaroni and cheese eaten in the car. So I need a little bit more. Um, thank you. With that being said, guys, please, if you like what we're doing, like, share, and subscribe to this, obviously. Uh, and uh, if you really want to support the Historical Fencing Guild's Patreon, it is there. As little as a dollar a month will get you stuff. Don't worry about the tears. New things are coming. I want to do some cool stuff. I just, between starting a company and uh, homeschooling Xander and my own health, I've been a little scrambled. So good things are coming there. Good things are coming uh, local. I will probably be doing, as this gets cleaned up, uh, some crafting videos because I do want to talk about at least gorget making. I want to talk about bracers because after the cup and possibly plastron, gorget, now I, I'd put the, the gorget before the plastron. So it goes uh, genital cover, uh, gorget to keep you from getting gacked up under the mask. Obviously, a mask or hell face protection. Where you're going to get the most damage learning to sword fight from miscalibrations various are to the arms. I teach a lot of arm sniping. So we're going to talk about how it's very actually simple to do bracers. And we'll, we'll reference the, the implied pattern I use in the simple sword to talk about bracers and what you can use to make them out, make them out of. So that's coming down. The Gorget video is, is coming down uh, this spring, this summer. Uh, I will be at Region Con in Cherville. Uh, next week, I hope to have all the information in such a way I can bring it up on all the screens uh, for a uh, gaming convention where I will be running Big Snoppy Robots. I will be doing art demos. It's going to be a good time. I may be running a few other things too. We shall see. I hope to see you guys there. I know I'll see Trey there. But with that, guys, do your drills, keep your eyes open, be kind to yourself and each other, and as always, friends, thank you for supporting your local Swordmaster. I will be back next week at this, you know, uh, 8 o'clock time for another episode of the Historical Fencing Guild live stream, and I will be back Monday at 10 a.m. on the sister channel to this, the Nicholas Tucker channel, for... Never mind the furthermore, my uh, creative support uh, morning show that I do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. All righty. Toodles, folks. <laughs>